So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Um, as Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs, I am delighted to welcome you to our latest IIEA webinar focused on economic recovery post COVID-19. We're joined today by Mark Coleman, who will discuss uh, the economic response to COVID-19, particularly in the light of the recent uh, domestic stimulus package and the EU response agreed last week at the European Council meeting in Brussels. Mark will speak to us for about uh, 20 minutes and then we will go to Q&A. And you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen in the usual way. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once Mark has finished his presentation. Today's presentation is on the record. Mark Coleman is founder of Octavian, an international policy and public affairs consultancy. Mark was formerly director of Financial Services Ireland and head of international business at IBEC, and a former economics editor at the Irish Times, a presenter at News Talk, an economist with the European Central Bank and the Department of Finance. Mark, you're very, very welcome indeed to this IIEA webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's a great privilege to be speaking to the Institute and its uh, members. Um, so thank you all. Um, at the outbreak of the last economic crisis, there was a plethora of very destructive, very protracted and very negative um, comment. And it was my firm belief that tens of thousands more jobs were lost than was necessary and that that crisis went on for perhaps a year or two more than was necessary as a result of it so when this crisis broke i was determined to do what i could to prevent that happening again and to influence an early constructive and positive narrative so um if we go to the first slide um and hopefully see the cover of the book um, and maybe get the full, if we can, the full um, picture there. Um, we were already, the planet was already on the brink before COVID as a result of a number of issues, uh, Brexit, uh, populism, growing gulf, and a breakdown in multilateralism. Um, and that sense of urgency was what motivated me in the middle of March to begin writing the book. Um, and you can see, I hope you can see on the bottom right hand side, the cover of the book. Um, in the next slide, you will also see some of the books um, in the next slide that I would have written in the previous crisis. And their function was really to try and promote long term positivity, long term support for trade and openness and as a regard for Ireland's tremendous global resources, the diaspora, respect in multinational institutions, our long-standing resilience with previous crises that we had come through in the 1950s and 1980s, and the latter two books in a more precise way uh, with input from the Tornishta, the Taoiseach, and various key stakeholders at the time, uh, tried to put a little bit more detail in terms of how we could use policy instruments at the European level and how we could use the great power of globalization, particularly in Asia, to power the recovery. So what I tried to do was to use as much as was relevant in those books, in the book that I'm gonna talk about now, while noticing obviously the key differences in this crisis. So in the next slide, uh, the next slide will tell you what the three key um, functions of the book are number one to promote confidence in early action it was written in april and there was an opportunity to shape the narrative and i wanted to take it number two i wanted to make the case for a just transition and talk about what that might mean in practice because there was a very unjust transition in the last crisis with some sectors faring far worse than others and given the election that we had had, it was my view that that is not something that the political system could sustain. So I wanted to illustrate how we needed this crisis to differ. And then thirdly, Ireland's tremendous potential 
um, in no small thanks to the work of the Institute of European Affairs, as recently shown by the, uh, the amazing success of our diplomats in securing a place on the UN Security Council, uh, the success of Pascal Donahue becoming president of the Euro. The question is, what could Ireland do to help influence things for the better at an EU and global letter, uh, level? So let's turn to one. And in the slide, um, one is basically um, promote confidence of the action. So further slide on from that, you'll see a timeline of the first couple of weeks. Um, we said the first case in the north on the 27th of February. We had the first case in the Republic on the 29th of February. Um, we had around the middle of March uh, a clear understanding that we were going to have a lockdown, <coughs> that schools were going to be closed. We didn't know how long for, and we had restrictions on travel. So on the 22nd of March, I came out with the first of my a weekly briefing, and the weekly briefings have run uh, both a few weeks before the book was published and subsequently, because I felt as well as a book, you need to update this, a situation that is moving very rapidly. And I'll talk a little bit about the first key messages that I put out there. The book was published on the 7th of April, after what I would call was a three weeks of uh, Stakhanovite intensive work, um, but which had the benefit of four previous books where I had a lot of narratives and structures that I could draw on. So we go to the next slide. What the first briefing aimed to do uh, on the 22nd of March was to give hope and give hope by pointing to three key differences with the last crisis. The first was that our personal debt is now much lower than it was in 2008. The growth in our economy is much, much more diversified. Um, you can see the growth story from the private sector credit. You can see the, the much healthier structure of our economy and external balance. Um, but there's a caveat to that, and the caveat is that government debt is much higher. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. In the next slide, um, another confidence booster is that our international trade portfolio <coughs> is much more diversified now. Uh, for example, our exports to Britain are less than 10% of total exports. Now that does, to a certain extent, understate our exposure in some more labor intensive sectors, but we're in a much better position now than 10 years ago and in a far better position than uh, when we joined the euro. And I'd like to hope that two of the books that I produced during the crisis would have played some role in directing the government's thinking towards that diversification agenda. In the next slide, uh, you'll see a more technical briefing which I produced on the 29th of March. And this was all about urging the HSE and the government to um, ensure that testing capacity bottlenecks were dealt with early on that we had a system for producing data and analytics to exploit and understand demographic and locational differences in the, the spread of the virus, and that we were dealing with beds and personnel bottlenecks. Why is that important from an economist's point of view? Well, because if you get your micro policy right, it means you don't have to have the lockdown for such a protracted period, or you can localize the lockdown so there's a strong link between macro, micro and macro. Um, the uh, success of uh, the developing of an app now, which is being shared with the rest of the world, is very welcome. And I think it illustrates the kind of leadership that I was talking about that Ireland could play. And um, it would, I think, have helped had that app come out some months earlier, but uh, we want to stay positive, so we won't dwell on that. But at least that briefing came out on the 29th of March. In the next slide, um, you're going to see a timeline and all of this material is in the book in one shape or form and I'll give people a link to the book. I wanted to convey a clear sense of crisis recovery and normalization. We're now somewhere in the middle of the crisis period and a key message in the book was that for us to bring forward the recovery and normalization period we would need to stimulate demand sometime in the middle of the year if we were going to get the recovery curve pointing upwards towards end 2020 or at least beginning Q1. Thankfully we've seen that in the last week now and that has happened. <coughs> but in the next slide you're going to see something a little bit worrying. 
And the next slide will show you two pieces of data from the April stability forecasts of government. And they showed that prior to the, to the stimulus, there was a strong, there was an expectation of a strong divergence between personal consumption on the one hand, which was expected to, to decline very rapidly as a result of the crisis, and on the other hand, government consumption, which was going to grow. Um, domestic demand was forecast to fall very dramatically, but net exports were uh, forecast to increase. And that looked like a rerun of the, uh, well, kind of a rerun of the 2008 crisis that we needed to avoid, because the, the more imbalanced uh, the growth is in between different sectors, the less of a just transition that you have. Now, that was the picture in April. Um, as I'm going to say later on, the stimulus and the forthcoming budget look like they're pointing in the right direction to dealing with that. Now, in the next section, we're going to talk about the second goal, which is just transition and demand stimulus. And I think that picture really says it all because uh, we are all in this together. Um, but there's an anecdote my corporate finance lecturer used to tell me about a chicken and a pig having a conversation before the farmers, the morning of the farmer's breakfast. And uh, the chicken turns to the pig and says, well, you know, we're both involved in the farmer's breakfast. Um, but whereas I'm involved, you're a little bit more committed. Uh, and I suppose the, the image there is that there is a spectrum in terms of job security, pension security, access to power. Um, there's a lot more pressure in the small business sector there's a lot more pressure uh, than there is, say, in the large corporate sector. There's more pressure in the large corporate sector than there is in most of the state-funded sector. And despite the relative size of the, 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 the people in that image, as I'm going to show later on, this, the SME sector, for example, accounts for 99.8% of all the companies in Ireland and employs over two-thirds. So ensuring that there is a much better distribution of balance, a balanced distribution of pressure is a key goal, not just economically, but politically. And the next slide will show you what happened the last time out. Um, and it will show you in the next slide, the bigger chart in the top of the middle shows you in yellow how the multinational dominated measure of GDP minus construction was basically recovering from 2009. Now, it didn't fully recover, but it was at least on the way back up, whereas the black line shows you that the more domestic economy had a relapse um, and went down significantly. And, and that means that the recession dragged on in the domestic economy, much more so than in the uh, multinational economy. And part of that story is illustrated by the taller graph on the further right, which shows you that contrary to the austerity narrative, most of the austerity was actually taxation rather than spending. Spending was certainly cut in some areas of public spending, but overall, spending in public administration education actually rose over the period. It was a bit of a zigzag motion, but it was actually higher in, by, by the end of the recession than at the start, whereas you see on the right-hand side curve, the black curve shows you that construction output fell by 50% which meant that we could have invested in capital spending. We could have built a lot of the houses that we now have discovered we needed, but we didn't because there were other priorities and we now have a housing crisis as a result. And um, the next slide will uh, show you some data from a Senate report, a Senate committee report on the small business sector <coughs> undertaken last year, showing that there was already a funding crisis in the SME sector and that there was particular exposure in, in, in wholesale and resale to issues like funding. And this, the facts are staggering. I mean, SMEs are 99.8% of all enterprises. 93% of them are Irish owned. They account for two thirds of employment. And um, a lot of them were left behind by previous initiatives. Sole traders, self-employed, they just fell through the nets and they're the most exposed. So I wanted to highlight that as quickly as possible. And I wanted to highlight in a way, and I mean no criticism, but I wanted to highlight in a way that I felt that some of the more established research institutes might not do because many of those people working there don't, have not worked in the private sector. So probably wouldn't see that, that it wouldn't be on their radar screen.
Um, in the next slide, uh, you will see um, what the SME sector were asking for. The SME recovery group uh, were asking for essentially a business reactivation scheme. They were saying, look, this crisis is as a result of a government edict, you know, a very understandable government edict, but it's not an act of the free market. It's, it's effectively imposed on the private sector. So we need that recognized in the form of a reactivation funding scheme. Businesses should not have to borrow to get through this crisis because they did not create, uh, did not create it. Um, there was also a request for cost flexing in terms of the ability to pass on some overhead. So if you've no income coming in, um, do you bear all the brunt of that or are you able to pass that through um, to your suppliers? Um, and that there should be a more flexible arrangement to preserve employment and maybe reallocate employees at least temporarily and then looking at state aid rules. Uh, some of that has come through. The next uh, slide will take you through the demands of the uh, Chambers Ireland group, which was made a, a very good presentation to the Oireachtas uh, Committee on COVID. They called for clear uh, clarity on tax liability on the temporary wage subsidy scheme, uh, for looking again at the loan schemes, calling for an extension of credit guarantee, which has pretty much happened. Uh, one can argue about the extent, but at least it's happened. And an improvement in the trading and business continuity voucher schemes, which had run out of funding. Uh, an augmentation of the restart grant, which has been, uh, an it has been augmented. And an extension of ta tax deferrals and waivers on rates, uh, which again has been, has been uh, um, brought in. The next slide um, will talk a little bit more about um, demand. So we had a saying in the last crisis that you cannot push in a piece of string. You can provide all the liquidity you want, but if there's no customer at the other end, um, that's no good to you. And uh, companies are very reticent to borrow because they don't feel the demand is there. So there's a number of measures that I recommended, which I won't go into too much detail, um, but they did include tax cuts. Um, and in the next slide, um, you will see basically in summary, there were seven things that I recommended in the April book. The first basically was a July stimulus. Um, I didn't go into the detail in this, this is a summary slide, but the first point was to understand the urgency of recovery, the need for both the July and an October budget. We've kind of got that now, that's been committed to in the program for government in the first half delivered last week. There was strong advocacy for EU cooperation on fiscal policy. Again, the ECB had pumped a lot of liquidity into the market, but we weren't seeing the fiscal action from the presidency. Again, that happened last week. Um, and then we wanted uh, tax cuts to stimulate demand and a commission on taxation. And we wanted to see partnership between multinationals and SMEs. The other two things that I called for were a recognition of the fact that business and taxpayers have really been underrepresented in policy. And secondly, the legacy of the debt from the last crisis needed to be looked at. And um, there's been no action on those two points. I think it's probably premature to address those, but I don't think those issues are gonna go away. Um, I won't dwell on them here, though, because we could talk a lot, a lot about them. The next slide will give you just a quick overview on the um, measures taken in the program for government. I won't dwell on them. Um, there are five key pillars. There's investment and stimulus, educating, uh, education, training, enterprise policy, business and financing, regulation and costs. It's all good stuff. It's all going in the right direction. The concern is the institutional implementation and making sure that the people implementing it and the institutions implementing it have people from a public, both a public sector background, an academic background to understand the theoretical issues, but critically also a private sector background. The mix will be essential to ensuring good implementation. The next slide will give you a sense of the magnitude of the stimulus we've just seen. Um, the next slide is a chart and over on the right you'll see the Comptroller and Auditor General's estimate of the uh, bank bailout costs as measured last September. Uh, you will see what various groups IBEC and ISME called for in terms of the magnitude of stimulus in the light blue chart, that's 15 billion. My own book called for 16 billion, which is close enough. There were differences in how the cake was split. What we've seen so far 
Well, we've seen last week, we've seen 7.2 billion. In fact, there are prior measures taken over the summer, which I won't go into too much detail, um, but there is a gap between what we've asked for of around eight or nine billion, some of which is accounted for by measures taken prior to last week, the remainder of which I'm quite confident uh, the budget forthcoming in October can close. Again, I'm not going to go into too much micro detail because we don't have time, uh, but I will go on now to the third and I think the most important pillar of this presentation, which is the idea of promoting EU and global co cooperation. Angel Gurria, OECD General Secretary, has a very good quote from him um, that the OECD's analysis underpins the need for sharper action to absorb the shock and a more coordinated response by government to maintain a lifeline to the private sector uh, and to deal with the health crisis. Now, the next slide will uh, break down for you the four pillars of what I'm going to finish up on. I'm going to talk about what we've learned from the rest of the world, which was dealt with in the book. I'm going to uh, look at what we've lear learned from the rest of the world, both from the previous SARS crisis, which is the only, it's the only laboratory we have to look at, what we've learned from the rest of the world in terms of this crisis, what other countries are, how, are, how they're responding, look at EU coordination, the potential for the Irish role, and then what I call a German lesson, but don't worry, I'm not going to start talking in German, it's more about policy lessons. Um, the next slide will show you a very nice picture of a gate in Hong Kong, and it will also show you that um, the Hong Kong and Ireland, Ireland economies are very similar in many respects. High GDP per capita, high uh, fixed exchange rate or pegged, very high openness, very high degree of travel and tourism, um, English common law business systems, high levels of foreign direct investment, and good quality of healthcare and sanitation. Two strong differences, obviously, are popula population density, excuse me, um, and the fact that um, Hong Kong is probably a little bit more dominated by the Chinese economy than the Irish economy. But otherwise, um, a pretty good similarity. And the positive news is on the next slide, which is that when SARS hit Hong Kong, and the death rate was roughly comparable to the death rate we have in this country, it bounced back very quickly. Uh, it, it in fact grew for the year 2003. Now, of course, the huge difference is that SARS was concentrated in Hong Kong and parts of southern China, whereas this crisis is much more global. So that means we've now got to look at the second point of this final stretch of the presentation, and that is the need for countries around the world to have fiscal uh, and economic policy uh, responses to deal with the sheer magnitude of this crisis. Hong Kong really didn't have to do that. China didn't really have to do that with SARS because it wasn't a big enough crisis, but that has to happen this time. <clears throat> so how well are the countries doing? Well, we'll see on the next slide. And if I can, on the next slide, ask you to, to look at the further, further rightmost column, the column furthest on the right, <clears throat> you will see the UK and Germany up there with combined stimulus. Now this is April we're talking about. Things have changed slightly. They haven't changed hugely for the UK, Germany and US, but they've changed a little bit. <clears throat> Germany leads the pack with a 30% injection into its economy, uh, an absolutely massive total of 1.1 trillion euros injected into the German economy. Um, Ireland at the time was very much trailing behind with 1.2%. As I said, this is pre-stimulus. Uh, things have moved on now, but that is the position where we had when the book was published. And that is where I thought there was a real need to point to the rest of the world to try and flag the urgency of what we needed to do. The next two slides I won't dwell on. I'll just, if we can just flash them momentarily. And um, they go through, they take a sample of countries and look at how early action was taken, how mandatory the action was, the decision level of action, was it central or regional government, and the principal features and tools of government policy. Um, the next slide will um, basically give you a quick timeline um, of how that worked out in terms of how soon the lockdown was ended. I'm not going to dwell on them, but what I'm going to focus here is that different policy effects have had the following result. And you'll see it in a quote on the next slide, uh, which I will read out. Um, so their ability to coordinate with each other, and I'm talking about different countries,
both in relation to reducing the divergence in approaches to both public health and fiscal monetary policy coordination challenges uh, is a crucial uh, issue. Given the aforementioned differences in policy appro approaches to containing the virus, this is likely to be spread over several quarters as the crisis peaks in different trading partners. That's a bit of a geeky kind of academic sentence, but the importance of it will be shown in the graph in the next chart, because this is what we are facing now. And you will see in yellow, Ireland's COVID curve is flattening out, but you will see in orange, the global curve continues to rise. So we have COVID cur curve divergence, which basically means as long as this situation persists, we have a threat of a second lockdown, or at least we have a second threat of the or, the or ratio going back up to critical level because of a lack of global coordination from the start. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, in one of my weekly briefings, um, I think it was week number 16, I put this picture of the globe. Uh, we had just won a UN security seat, um, a seat, council seat, and I was feeling very proud. I asked the question, can Ireland save the world? Um, and then the following slide, two weeks later, Pascal Donoghue got appointed to the president of the Eurogroup. I was absolutely delighted for him personally, but also for the country, because I think it illustrates the clout that we have. And also Simon Coveney um, uh, brought, uh, came along with funding for the World Health Organization at a time uh, when it was badly needed. So I think we have done ourselves proud and I think our strategic links as a bridge between the America and the EU and to the UK and Asia, thanks to the excellence of our diplomats, I must say, um, is, it means that we can play a role that uh, is way, in, in, way above our sizes as, as, as a nation. Um, if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to finish up now on a few points of policy coordination. My former employer, the European Central Bank, was very quick to act as were the other central banks. Um, it made a 750 billion intervention, but as I've said before, liquidity push is no good unless you have demand pull. So in the next slide, you will see a quote um, with a picture of both Christine Lagarde and Ursula von der Leyen. And the quote is, um, if fiscal and monetary policy coordination was desirable during the last crisis, it is an absolute imperative now, not just at national, but at EU and as far as possible at global level. And then the next slide will give you the positive news in that last week, uh, Charles Michel, after a marathon five-day session, uh, uh, President of the European Council announced we did it. And it there was a 750 billion package of supports, incorporating a 390 billion uh, package in grant aid for the first time uh, underlying collective, uh, introducing collective borrowing to be repaid by 2058 by funding on tax and digital activity, uh, tax on plastics and digital activity. Um, and key elements are related to the climate agenda, the just transition, and the digital agenda. And then finally, I want to uh, finish on what I call the German lesson. And uh, our director, Michael Collins, was extremely uh, hospitable and gracious in letting us use the um, German embassy when he was our ambassador to Germany, our, the Irish embassy in Germany when myself and Ralph Lissek published Ireland and Germany Partners in European Recovery. And we looked at the success of Germany in pulling through previous crises. And we derived some lessons about how some, what features of the German economy enable it to uh, recover more quickly. Well, it's a very pro small business economy. It has efficient regulation, low taxes, strong SME to, uh, access to credit, and in that book, we wrote about the Credit Anstalt für Wiederaufbau, which was the institution set up to promote growth after the devastation of Germany in after the last war. And remember, the Germans have been through a situation where they, they had to reconstruct everything. And we recommended the establishment of a similar institution here. And the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland was the result the following year. But Germany also has good spatial policy, affordable housing, fair and efficient rents, rates, a very well-functioning public sector, low cost of living, very competitive internal markets for things like insurance, and it has a very good labor market and a system of apprenticeship and Kurzarbeit. I think also on the next slide, a key point uh, before we go to the next slide is that Germans understand the importance of representing the taxpayer and the small business in politics. They learned the hard lessons, 
those sectors were not represented well um, in the 1920s and 30s. They understood that a properly functioning social market democracy requires a strong voice for the small business and the taxpayer. That's an absolutely crucial insight for the next few years. And it brings me to the last few slides, if we can go to the next one, in terms of fairness in policy representation and debate. And we can go one slide ahead and we can go back to our image of the pressure coming down from the top. I think what policymakers must understand is that they, they may not realize how much in charge of the narrative they are. Uh, none of us begrudge it to them, it's not a criticism, but the policy making world is by and large one of job security, where pay and pensions are immunity from the crisis, and there's good access to influence, good access to media, there's an ability to use the Exchequer and the NTMA to fund any, uh, uh, you know, to tide you over for the next few years, universities are assured of funding, Large corporates are one rung down. They have strong cash reserves. They can withstand the lockdown for a good period of time. They're not immune in the long term, but they're relatively resilient in the short to medium term. They have a good strong voice in the corridors of power, and they also have the resources and expertise to comply with the various back to work restrictions and the bureaucracy that must accompany COVID-19. Whereas at the bottom, the, the small businesses, the sole traders, the self-employed, they're the most vulnerable to demand severe impact on cash flow. It's an existential threat to their livelihoods that many of them don't even have pensions. They have terrible access to funding. Um, well, I, sorry, that's unfair. They don't have terrible access to funding, but there's a serious funding issue uh, already pre-COVID. And they have a relatively weak voice uh, in policy making compared to say Germany or other countries. And they have very little resources to comply with a lot of the health restrictions that are coming out as a result of COVID. There's another kind of divide, which we show on the next slide. Um, and it, it's the demographic divide. And the stark fact is that the rate of unemployment amongst 18 to 25 year olds is 45%. I mean, that, that, is, that is like a science fiction rate of unemployment. And that is because the weakest sectors uh, are the ones with the highest youth participation. We've already heard a very loud <laughs> signal from the demographic, uh, the, the, the youth cohort in the last election in relation to housing. Again, asset rich older age court cohorts tend to vote more, tend to have more of a political uh, voice. So younger voters were already straight, struggling with the accommodation issue. COVID-19 now moves them from the frying pan into the fire in that regard. Um, so finally, um, a point about equity and confidence in policy making. Um, we are going to have to devote a lot of attention to this. Um, I think one thing that stood out in my mind, there was a very good event. It was, it was very well intentioned and all of the speakers were excellent. Um, it, it was pulled, it was a conference on small business funding. It was intended for the 30th of January and all of the speakers were excellent. I know most of them personally, but I did notice one fact. Of the 13 speakers at this event planned to discuss the crisis already facing the small business sector in funding, 12 of them, 12 of them came from within the public sector. And one of them, only one of them was representing the small business community. Now, imagine, if you will, if you had a conference which was promoting the role of women in business and you had 13 speakers and 12 of them were men and only one of them were women. That really tells you that diversity, uh, gender diversity is extremely important but diversity in policy making is going to be the key challenge of the next couple of years. So I'm going to sum up in one, the next slide is going to sum up everything in four key messages, two positive messages and two worrying ones. The good news, the first two bits of good news are that, that the first immediate challenge I spotted in April was we had a real pro challenge of a divergence between a more sheltered, um, publicly funded and a more sheltered multinational sector on one hand, and on the other, the SME and the private sector. Now that divergence is still a threat, but it is being addressed. The good news is that the stimulus, and I hope the budget is going in the right direction. The second piece of good news is that the divergence I feared between monetary policy, which was very active, and fiscal policy at the EU level, uh, that divergence is now being addressed thanks to the EU presidency initiative last week. The less positive news, uh, it relates to point three, the divergence between Ireland's flattening COVID-19 curve and the upwardly rising global curve 
that is threat number one. That's the threat of the second lockdown. And the final threat is a more domestic one that I've just spoken about between public and private sector input to policy making. I don't think that has yet been addressed and it would be far better to tackle it now and actively and, and do it before it's too late. And for anybody who's interested, there's a little information about me on the next slide, but uh, people can look at that at their own leisure. And at the last slide, um, for anybody who would like to, I do a weekly briefing which updates on the book because things are moving so fast. If anybody would like a copy of the weekly update, just contact me on those details and I'd be delighted to put you on the list. Thank you for your patience and Michael, apologies that I've gone over time. That's not a problem at all, Mark. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a vast amount of detail there that I'm sure people will want to uh, follow up on and we're likely to be able to cover all of it uh, in any further detail, I suppose, uh, beyond that in the Q&A. But maybe just to, to, to get the ball rolling and giving, giving the, your, your particular reference uh, to, to, to Germany there. I mean, it is striking that the size of the stimulus, the, the, the stimulus in Germany, I think you mentioned it was 30% of, of GDP, I think it is, isn't it? Uh, and, and ours in April was, was in around uh, just about the 1.2%. About the I know it's been improved since then. Mm. What, what hope is there for everybody else in Europe if the Germans are likely to be motoring out ahead uh, to the extent that they are with this level of stimulus beyond the capacity I presume, of any other country uh, to, to, to offer to, in its domestic space? Well, I, I think the Germans are probably too polite to say this, Michael, but there is an obligation, and they have invested in an awful lot of uh, providing money, structural and cohesion funds, to country like, countries like Ireland. And there is a, an equal responsibility on the member states to be vigilant in responding uh, to this crisis. I think the size of the German, uh, I can't speak for the German government, I don't represent the German government, but I would imagine that the sheer size of Germany's um, response also uh, reflects a sense of responsibility that the Germans have as the largest economy. So I think they are doing it to a significant degree uh, to help the other economies of Europe as much as to help themselves. Um, but I think the onus is on, uh, I think the bigger countries tend to to, um, to, to have bigger programs. We shouldn't beat ourselves up too much, however. Remember that um, very helpful uh, and welcome measures were implemented by the public service in Ireland at a time when we didn't have a government. So I don't think there's anything I'm saying that's criticizing Ireland. Uh, we did what we could given that we didn't have a government. And when a government was formed in July, it has in the last four weeks come out with a stimulus package that while it isn't perfect, is very, very promising. And we have another three months because, as I called for in the book, a July stimulus and an October budget, we're now going to get both. We've had the July stimulus. There is now another three months to design a budget. And the program for government has very, very positive and very appropriate um, motifs that I think will really help uh, uh, us close the gap. Okay, well, that's a good point. I mean, uh, if Germany's doing well, I suppose all of Europe is likely to be doing that a little bit better as well, including ourselves, of course. Uh, I think we're the third. Germany's, uh, we, we, you know, Germany's our third most important export market. So, as I say, if their economy is, is, is beginning to thrive again, uh, and I suppose the verdict is still out on that. I mean, I don't know what the recent figures are from Germany in terms of the, uh, the way in which they are recovering, but I suspect, like elsewhere in Europe, despite the stimulus, it's relatively hesitant. Yeah, I did a briefing uh, on the German recovery, and it is looking positive now. You, you, you've you caught me. I can't remember the exact figures, but um, as early as May, uh, there were signs that the retail confidence and recovery was beginning to return. Um, it, I stress, it cannot be stressed enough, the speed of Germany's recovery reflects... T.K. Whitaker uh, did one great thing for this country, and, and he, he made us understand the importance of external competitiveness. And the IDA have done a, an amazing job on promoting Ireland as a place where the external economy is fantastically competitive. And our, uh, our low corporation tax really reflects that. The news about Amazon, a thousand jobs coming from Amazon is, is really positive in that regard. But it cannot be stressed enough that the domestic economy is a far higher tax, a far higher cost, and does not operate with the sufficient degree of flexibility that you would find, for example, in Germany or Austria and the Netherlands. That is going to be our challenge because the domestic side of our private sector is where all the pressure is going to be. And the faster we can get competitive markets and efficiency, uh, 
and efficient implementation of policy, the sooner we will start to behave like Germany um, in terms of having a much more balanced and much more even spread of both the recession and much more even benefits from the recovery. Okay, Mark, so just to bring it back home, I suppose, a question here from Peter McLone, uh, who's a board member of the IAEA. He wants to know what are Mark's thoughts on how to stimulate uh, a reboosting of the uh, interrelated tourism, hospitality, and aviation sectors? Or are we facing a prolonged period before recovery starts, presumably in those sectors? It's an excellent question from Peter. Um, <clears throat> I would say that in relation to tourism, um, we, we are here uh, a prisoner of the what I call the COVID curve divergence. Um, and there is really nothing we can do about that other than stimulate domestic demand. And I would link that to uh, the recent um, staycation voucher, which was a very welcome initiative. And I think that I would urge government to take a look at that voucher. It's going in the right direction. But I would urge that it would think about, first of all, being a little bit more generous with the size of the voucher and making it easier for people to actually spend the money. And the first response of a policymaker is very understandable. It's to use the tax system. And that is entirely, inappropriate, entirely appropriate and correct where you are designing measures to stimulate the business sector. Why? Because businesses have tax advisors. Businesses being, having corporate form tend to think in multi-annual tax years. So it's absolutely appropriate and correct to use the tax system and tax uh, credits. For individuals and families, it doesn't work like that. The tax system is a burden, it's a hassle, it's not understood. So I think there's a golden opportunity for the government to just, it's got, I think, 90% of everything right in the stimulus. And I think it's done a very good job. I would be urging government to look again at the staycation voucher, make it more generous, make it more accessible. And I think we could be getting a lot of families uh, visiting, a lot of families who need a break, bringing the tourism sector back to life. I'm delighted to see uh, that uh, a former colleague of mine, David Swan, has been appointed to the aviation group, which has been set up. He's a very good person. Um, and I think that the aviation sector is of critical importance. I haven't prepared any thoughts on that, Peter. I apologize to you, but I will try and address it in a future brief because it is a very important one. Thank, th thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, of course, you mentioned several times there the, um, the, the, the budget, the autumn budget, of course, which is another um, the opportunity for the government to, to introduce further measures or to, uh, to, to, to take, take further initiatives. Uh, and of course, an awful lot can happen between this and then, uh, including the, the possibility, of course, of a, of a relapse of some description, God forbid, but nonetheless, a possibility that has to be kind of at least um, uh, anticipated to some extent. What uh, do you anticipate will be the, the, the gaps or the, uh, the issues that have not so far been addressed by government? Uh, in its stimulus package most recently last week that are likely now or that, that would be likely to be need, 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 needing to be addressed in, in the autumn budget I mean there are lots of other aspects uh, to the budget as well but where do you think the um, the the, uh, the further initiatives lie are, are, are we I suppose at the maximum of what can we be satisfied that we're at the maximum of what we can do for today almost I think you said uh, the, the, the stimulus was more or less right uh, so far so good there are obviously some shortcomings but where would you see the autumn uh, giving further opportunity to sweeten the pot even more. So it, it's an excellent question, Michael. And I would draw uh, two, two distinctions between the stimulus that we have had and the, uh, the, 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 the October budget. <coughs> and they're necessary and good distinctions. The first distinction is that the stimulus is necessarily designed to tackle what I call the crisis period. You may remember I showed a chart of crisis recovery and normalization. It's back up a few slides. Um, it's primarily oriented at keeping the economy going through the second half of this year, getting through that tunnel into early next year. And that's why it needed to be done in July. Um, by contrast, the October budget is able to look at a multi-annual budget framework over the entire three year period. That's the first distinction. The second distinction, and, and then I'll answer your, your excellent question, is that the stimulus measure measures are necessarily applied across all sectors of the economy with some exceptions, the staycation voucher we've spoken about, but most of them 
are designed for all sectors and all regions of the economy. Whereas if you look in the program for government, there is a, a lot of very useful um, direction towards town investment in town centers, investment in sustainable communities, um, really rethinking our spatial balance away from putting everything in the center of Dublin, which we've done up to now, and more targeted spatial investment. So in October, the government will have the time and over the next three months to really study instruments that are more precise, more adaptable, and more long-term. So the two instrument, that's why the two instruments were needed, one for the here and now, and one for the longer term. And I would say a key issue is housing, in answer to your question. Um, there wasn't time to deal with the housing crisis. It hasn't gone away, you know, if I can use the phrase. <coughs> it's still there. And it's going to have to be the focus of, of October. Not only that, Michael, but if I may say, at the very back of the book that I wrote in chapter seven, I had a, an entire chapter on what I call correcting Ireland's lost decade of investment. And in the book, which is free, by the way, everybody can access it uh, on the website. You just see the, the book and just click on it. Chapter seven shows how really we, we got it totally wrong we, we, we really decimated public investment between 2008 and 2018. We could have built the houses, we could have built the, the schools and the road, we didn't. We now need to do that with urgency. And that is the one issue we should not be afraid to borrow for. We should be borrowing, um, provided we have good control of value for money, we should be borrowing with gusto for public investment and housing on an enormous scale. Okay, just uh, maybe just turning to the European stimulus package, um, of, of which we are going to be the beneficiaries uh, in excess of um, obviously uh, one billion plus whatever we get out of the Brexit fund. Um, and first of all, do, do you think we're getting our fair share out of the European uh, um, um, uh, stimulus uh, uh, package? Uh, obviously, it's, I think it's a good day's work uh, that, uh, that Europe demonstrates uh, that, that it can come, uh, come together in the way, the way that it has. But I suppose, um, you know, just a question of, I suppose, whether, whether, uh, whether Europe, uh, you know, the, the package that's coming from Europe and the money that's coming from Europe, uh, is it enough to make a difference in our case? The bulk of the money is clearly going to Italy, it's going to Spain, it's going to the countries that are most, have been most affected by the, the, the pandemic. First of all, did we get a fair shake in the package? And secondly, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, d d is, is one billion plus going to make much of a difference at the end of the day? I would say, uh, Michael, as, as, as somebody who tries to be a good European and who grew up in Germany and hence my interest in the country, that when I was born 50 years ago, the population of the Republic was 3 million. And it was a country where the income per capita was 40% below the European average. We're now a country of 5 million, and depending on what measure of economics you use, our income per capita is between 20 and 40% above the EU average. So in answer to any question, have we got our fair shake out of Europe? I would say absolutely. Over the long term, yes. I would say that after 50 years of immensely successful engagement in Europe, we have to realize now we're one of the leading nations of Europe. We really are up there in terms of reputation, economic performance, credibility. And I think with that has to come a certain maturity that um, we, have, we have received so much and we've worked for it, we've earned it, that there does come a point in time where those questions, I think, just need to be responded to by looking at the long-term fundamental transition we have got from Europe. And in the words of John F. Kennedy, I think it may be time to ask the question, ask not what Europe can do for you, but ask what you can do for Europe. Well, indeed, Europe may come asking in some areas, including in areas like taxation and digital taxation in particular. I, but maybe I would, say, I would make one caveat to that in that I did notice the role of public debt during the last crisis. Um, I think going forward, the steady state current management of policy, um, I think things are going broadly correct. There is that lump of debt from the last crisis and I refer to it in the book, I don't think that issue uh, is, is entirely something we can just completely ignore. I think as our debt ratio goes up, we may need to remain open to having a constructive conversation about it. But other than that, I think the presidency arrangement of last week is, is a fair deal. Very good. Okay. Uh, from a colleague in the Institute, uh, Dara, Dara Moriarty, uh, he said, we saw Amazon announce a thousand jobs this week. You've already referred to that in Ireland. And we 
also of course had the Apple tax ruling. Uh, do you have any concerns regarding renewed pressure coming on US multinationals uh, to boost investment in the US uh, and a particular, sing a particular singling out of Ireland by President Trump in the forthcoming election campaign? And if I may just add to that, I mean, one of the things one of the ways in which, of course, Ireland has, 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 has succeeded over um, the last number of decades is the fact that we have become, a, um, a, you know, we were participating in the beneficiaries of, a global, of the global economy. And to the extent that globalization now is becoming somewhat of a, of a diminished, uh, 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 that, that its prospects may be somewhat diminished, is this an additional threat uh, to us? Uh, and that brings in the whole question of repatriation of, of maybe some strategic industries uh, not just to the United States, but to elsewhere as well. But Dara's well, question, obviously, um, obviously, the threat from the US, the, th the threat from further measures by by, by President Trump. Well, I, I will I will respond, uh, uh, knowing that there are people in the institute with far more expertise and intelligence than I to answer uh, that particular question. I quote one of my favourite episodes of Father Ted and say that uh, that would be an ecumenical uh, that would be an ecumenical matter. If you remember that line. Um, the, in, in relation to Ireland being singled out, there is an OECD BEPS process. Um, IBEC, I think, have been very vigilant on this, uh, as have other organizations like American Chamber, in making sure that we have a smooth transition. Uh, it's not that we do not want to participate in everybody paying their fair share, but I think what we need to make sure is that the multilateral approach of the OECD is paramount. Um, so that we have a smooth, ordered transition to a fair global co corporation tax environment, one in which countries like Ireland can plan their adjustment in good order and with good notification. What we do not want is sudden surprises and sudden rulings um, that upset the apple cart in terms of disturbing arrangements that were understood and enter entered into by pa parties acting in good faith. So in that sense, I think the ruling was very positive for Ireland. However, however, um, we are going to face the question that if we look at the last recovery, even before we go into the divergence of COVID and its impact on, on different sectors of the economy, as I've spoken about, the stark difference in the benefits of the last Irish recovery to the, in multinational sector and the domestic sector is huge as is the difference between the average uh, the corporation tax rate is 12 and a half percent here the marginal income tax rate is over 50 percent there's a gap of 40 percentage points between what the you know someone on 50 grand will pay in marginal income tax to government and what a corporation tax will pay now if we go to germany the corporation tax rate is something like 26 percent i would not advocate you know any increase in corporation taxes but we need to think about the fact that the average tax on income in Germany is around 28%. So it's about an e the question of the evenness will, may confront us. And uh, for example, the universal social charge, which is applied to the self-employed in a very discriminatory ma manner. I, I think the risk is that the domestic, uh, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the US presidential election. And I, to our, I couldn't answer, Dara, I think Dara could answer the question as well as I could. I don't know what's going to happen there, um, and, and there are other people who can do better. What, what I do worry about is that we need to have a domestic conversation about uh, the political equity of how we tax the multinational sector and that the incentives we have for indigenous Irish entrepreneurs uh, in setting up companies here and getting funding here. And I worry that that could be an issue if we don't address it. Okay, just a question here um, uh, from Michael Totty, who will be well, will be well known to, um, to you, former, of course, senior official in the Department of Finance, among other things here. He, he asks, uh, do you expect that the recovery in the economy would be sufficient to eventually balance the exchequer books, or will cutbacks or extra taxes be inevitable in future years? Well, it's great pleasure to receive uh, um, uh, a question from my former boss, and I hope Michael as well. Um, to answer that question, I would I would immediately be starting to separate the current and capital account, um, and you know I'm not so worried about capital borrowing. Um, I think we have done far too little of it, quite frankly. On the current side, um, I will link the answer to the previous question: Do we need to extract more taxation from the economy 
not necessarily. A better strategy would be to enrich and to deepen the involvement of the multinational sector in the domestic economy. And let me illustrate that with two figures. So during the last recovery, and I was speaking about the divergence between the multinational sector, GDP increased by 66% in the last five years. That is a staggeringly amazing figure. But gross national income uh, modified, which is the measure of the domestic measure, increased by 22%. There is no economy I know where there is such a stark divergence. Not to blame the multinationals, they are fantastic and they are doing great work here. But that gap tells me that we have an amazing opportunity to enrich both the labor intensity and the tax yield from multinational activity simply by having strategies of effective partnerships between multinationals and small businesses. It's what I called for in my book and the program for government is moving towards that. It speaks of clusters of activity within sectors where you get multinationals and small businesses to deepen their supply chain interaction. If you do that, you will automatically get an improved tax yield. Um, and that is, I think, a better and more natural way. Do we need to cut costs in public spending? I hope not. But I would say that uh, I remember, Michael, as a, as a great, uh, one of the country's greatest pub. We just lost her, I think, momentarily there, Mark, but I'm sure you were making a, 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 a telling point. But we're coming towards the end, and I just wanted to get in one question because it would be bordering on the surreal. Uh, in the context of this uh, presentation, if we didn't at least pay uh, three or four minutes attention to Brexit. Uh, I, you know, so uh, I, I just on the Brexit issue, um, we spoke about Germany, obviously, um, uh, you know, the, the extent to which uh, we can anticipate a decent recovery in, in Britain, with or without a, a, a deal uh, at the end of the year, obviously that's going to affect our economy as well. Obviously, the better the deal, that they, the relationship with the European Union, the better it is for us. Um, I mean, so we have we have the, uh, the 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 Brexit challenge as well coming down the line, uh, which has to be factored in. We'll know more about that, of course, in the next number of months. Uh, but what's your current prognosis in terms of the the challenges that that, as far as you can see them, the challenges that they represent um, uh, to the Irish economy? Given the prospect, I suppose, that most people are talking about now of a, a relatively thin uh, deal, rather than kind of the overwhelmingly um, the, the the larger deal that at one stage we we might have liked to believe was possible. Well, regrettably, you're right. The Brexit challenge, I mentioned how, how we have diversified our exports um, and how this was positive in dealing with COVID, but I put a caveat on it. And the caveat is that Britain's share of labour-intensive uh, Irish exports is still very uh, significant in the food and fisheries sector, for example. Um, what we need to do as a matter of urgency is look at the impact of a no-deal Brexit, look at the WTO regime that will prevail, look at the tariff impacts on the export sectors. I remember doing this in the Department of Finance when Michael was there, and we did it with the ESRI in the run-up to EMU. We're going to have to do it again, and this time we are going to have to target markets on continental Europe, particularly Germany, and look at Seabridge and Landbridge alternatives and use the transport infrastructure program to ensure that Irish exporters um, and the excellent work of Board Bia and Board Iskawara um, and Enterprise Ireland, we're going to have to accelerate and resource um, getting Irish exporters ready for alternative markets, particularly in Germany, which has 82 million consumers. If we work hard and if we also target Asia, as I've said in two previous books, there is more than enough demand to absorb our, the exports we will lose to Britain. But we have to work and we have to invest also in learning languages, may I say here. Um, I've been honoured by being designated a champion of foreign language use of business by the Languages Connect program, which is run by the Department of Education and Skills. We are going to have to get out of the mindset that the only place to go is Britain, uh, because it isn't anymore. But there's a psychological bar barrier in our exporters. If we can get them over that, there's a market of 430 million people not too much further away. There's another 3 billion people in Asia, by the way. So in the medium to long term, I'm not so worried. But we have to act now. Mark, we're, we're precisely on time. Uh, we're, we've, we've, uh, we've reached 5 o'clock. And I'm just going to draw proceedings uh, to a close uh, by, by thanking you.
I mean, an extraordinary amount of, of information, an extraordinary amount of insight, an extraordinary amount of, uh, it's a very rich theme in terms of the, the books you've been writing and the books that inevitably you will continue to write because uh, this is an issue, obviously, uh, which, which ob the, the, all the issues around this, obviously, are, are worth the, um, uh, the, the reflection that, 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 that you give, give them. So I want to just, on, behalf, on my own behalf, on behalf of the IAEA, just to say thank you to you. Uh, I think you've given the details of follow up if people want to contact you and to uh, benefit from your from your briefings. Uh, I, and obviously, we commend uh, your 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 efforts and, and the insights that you offer. And just to say you've been very welcome here at the institute this afternoon. We look forward to seeing you again on a future occasion. Thank you so much, Michael. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.